delighted by her newfound fame, Schaefer told Hollywood Reporter journalist Sue Cameron about the flood of fan mail she was receiving. Look, I'm getting fan mail, and it's great, and I'm answering them back, and it's wonderful. And I went, wait a minute, you can't do that. They're not your friends. Cameron's advice proved eerily prophetic. When a 16-year-old with a family history of mental illness named Robert Bardo reached out to the rising starlet. This looks to be a case of erotomania, a delusional belief that there exists a real relationship with a celebrity. Bardo believes he is in a relationship with Rebecca Schaefer. He actually goes from Tucson, where he lives, to Hollywood, to the production lot where they are filming My Sister Sam. The security guy is there to get out of here. You know, we've been told that she should not be here. He's very mean to me, you know? And when I left there, you know, I was very angry and upset. That's when I, I think it was the first time I seriously thought that I could cause harm to her. Oblivious to the growing danger, Schaefer focused on her career, landing a role in Paul Bartel's quirky bedroom farce, Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills, playing a sexually adventurous 20-something. My idea of taking a risk is losing my birth control pills or, or shopping at sex without a sale. She was like, you're kind of like a whore and it was kind of weird because they kind of betrayed an image of her. Rebecca was auditioning for the career-making role of Al Pacino's daughter in The Godfather Part Three. Rebecca was expecting the script that she would need for her audition. So that might be why she just opened the door to this stranger thinking that he was delivering this script. I, I introduced myself. I'm Robert Bartle. I'm the fan of yours, you know. Rebecca excused herself to prepare for her audition. A few minutes later, Bardo returned. What's in your plan, you know? Like, I thought that was very costly to say to a fan. I was going to say, it was wrong, grab, grab on the trip. Here. Just going. Why? Why? Bardo fled the scene, leaving Schaefer dying on the steps of her West Hollywood apartment building. Here was a trusting young girl whose doorbell rang and she answered it. She was going to be a huge star. I think she would have been one of the biggest. In 1989, 18 year old Selena was becoming the queen of Tejano music. I saw a star. I thought she was going to be the next. Gloria Estefan. Selena caught the eye of a 31-year-old registered nurse named Yolanda Saldivar, who tracked down the singer's father, Abraham. She had left quite a few messages on my recorder, wanting to start a fan club in the San Antonio area for Selena. Those messages put Selena on a collision course with Yolanda Saldivar. When she first came to our circle, we accepted her as a friend. Yolanda opened up about her desire to start the fan club. Going through my college years, I had no social life. I had voted myself to my university, my career, my, my license. Now it was time for me to have fun. So in 1994, Selena focused her attention on a new venture, hiring designer Martin Gomez to create clothing for her boutique, Selena, etc. She was beyond just a singer. Entertaining was her job, fashion was her passion. But with a demanding performance schedule, Selena needed someone to manage the boutiques. Yolanda Saldivar had earned Selena's trust after she established Selena's fan club and became part of her family. So, Selena offered the job to Yolanda. Yolanda's work for the star became suspect when Selena's father began to notice discrepancies in the books for both the fan club and the fashion business. Yolanda had taken up some funds from the employees to give Selena a present. And later on, we found out that she paid with Selena's uh, corporate card. A closer look revealed that there was over $60,000 missing from the boutique and fan club. On March 31st, 1995, Yolanda asked Selena to meet her at a Days Inn in Corpus Christi to talk about the misunderstanding. She told Selena to come alone. Just before noon, a single gunshot rang out. While hotel staff tried to stop the bleeding,
police and an ambulance were hurrying to the scene where Yolanda had barricaded herself in her truck. A police negotiator arrived at the Days Inn Motel where Yolanda held a gun to her head and refused to come out. Okay, in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank you, you're the God. Yeah. I'm going to kill it for it. I'm going to kill it for my boat. And then I pulled it out. It just went out because the barrel was back. I didn't mean to do it. I did it. I'm coming out. In a 1995 interview with 2020, Yolanda revealed why she surrendered. Why didn't you commit suicide when you were in the car all those nine and a half hours? I hear her tell me, you don't commit suicide because I'll never see you in heaven. Well, look into your eyes. Through 2012, Grimby continued to post covers of hit songs requested by fans, including songs by Nelly and David Guetta. It proved a winning formula that made Christina the fourth most subscribed musician on YouTube. Oh my goodness! Are you my fan? <laughs> but hidden among the many fans who celebrated Grimmy's success was the dangerously obsessed Kevin Loibel. Best Buy tech Keith Moran described his co-worker in a 2018 interview. He was an advanced repair agent, which is basically the highest level of uh, computer repair tech there. A highly intelligent guy. We invited him out places and stuff like that. He just didn't care to have much of an outside social life. As Christina's star continued to rise, Kevin Loibel's obsession deepened. The LASIK eye surgery, the hair surgery. Uh, he was losing weight to become a professional streamer with video games. And then that would lead him to meet her. Kevin Loibel engages in all this transformation. The idea being, becoming her dream person would be the route to getting close to her. She started dating this guy and had just posted a picture of her and Steven on social media, which supposedly set this gunman off. In early June, Christina Grimmie posted this message. Please come to the show if you live near Orlando, Florida. Uh, we are at the Plaza Live. Please come out. Bye. How was he that day? He's like, I love you, brother. And he grabbed my shoulder. He's told me he's tired. He's ready to ascend. At 7 p.m. on the evening of June 10th, 2016, 22-year-old Christina Grimmie took the stage at the Plaza Live in Orlando, Florida. During the concert, Kevin Loibel was captured on security cameras at the back of the venue, waiting for the after-concert meet-and-greet. Christina's brother, Marcus, later described the tragic events that followed. Every normal night, concert's over. Concert's over, I'm getting ready, just selling merch. She's meeting people. So Marcus, did you hear like any statements the guy made before? He said nothing, nothing. Literally nothing. Right. Just walked up, it just happened. I hear a shot, and I'm looking, more shots. I jump on the guy immediately screaming at him and he just throws me off like it's nothing. The concept that still makes me get emotional, that she was reaching out to hug the person who murdered her, it just says so much about her. Just a genuine, loving spirit.